Hey, it's Greg Otten here with MaritimeGardening.com. Uh, I was out just collecting some food in the garden here, and uh, I thought I'd do a video. I got an idea for a video, what I'm going to call the uh, ultimate follow-up video. I, I, I don't know that it actually is the ultimate follow-up video, but for me it is because it'll be the biggest one I've done. I'm just going to walk around and show you various projects or things that I tried in my garden and just give you sort of a status update on those things just in case you were curious how did that thing work out how did that thing work out what went up did that did that work did it not work and so on and so forth so um, come along let's have a look around okay so I thought I'd start here with this uh, really dumb idea I had for training these squash along a trellis <laughs> Anyway, I've got, I've, got, I've got to tie them up every two days, give or take, because they seem to be growing about a foot a day, even though they're sort of underneath this bit of a tree canopy here, and there's another big tree over here. This is not an ideal spot to be growing squash, but they're, they're doing okay. Anyway, the squash have made it all the way to that tree there, and I just put a, this morning, I put this log going down, giving them a ladder Instead of them going straight down and possibly breaking, I'll train them down. Uh, anyway, they're doing fine, but uh, it would have been a lot easier if I just aimed them up the hill, because I haven't done anything with these and they're doing great. <laughs> and because they're light-seeking, they're literally finding a path up that hill. This is a south-facing hill. Uh, and you know, As I've shown you, there's some shade, but they're literally finding their way up the hill where they want to be trying to seek light. So it's a lot easier, if you can, to just let the plants take care of themselves. Uh, this was a dumb idea. <laughs> but anyway, uh, kind of a fun, weird thing to try. So I've got a little ladder going down and, and so on and so forth. So just in case you're curious, they are doing fine. And I mean, you can see there, this, this one here has gone halfway across to the tree. And this one here has gone up and into the tree. It's going to start finding its way down in a matter of days. These parsnips that I thinned have really, you know, benefited from it. So, I'd like to say this was by design, but by sheer laziness, I just haven't got around to thinning these ones yet. I need to do that really soon. It's just been so hot. Uh, it's just been too hot in the horse flies, or I'd, I'd have to come out here at 5 a.m. or something, which, which I should do anyway. Um, anyway, shed of sheer laziness, I left these unthinned, and these ones are thin. And I don't know if it comes across on camera. They're uh, all the same variety of parsnip. But these ones, where I did, them, did my thinning, which was a few weeks ago now, are the leaves are larger, the leaves are deeper in color, a, a deeper uh, green. Than the ones over here. You can almost, I don't know if that comes across, but these are more like a lime green, a lighter green. And uh, these ones are just a deeper, uh, more of an evergreen, generally speaking. So, you know, because, uh, you know, there were some comments saying, well, just let them sort themselves out and so on. And you, know, you can do that, right? But I, I think you'll find that you get more. The net effect is bigger, fatter parsnips if you do a bit, a bit of thinning. Because they're just giving the, the ones that remain the best sort of conditions they could possibly get. This isn't really a follow-up, but this is an interesting uh, observation. Uh, three years ago, I had a, um, I had a really haphazard makeshift uh, greenhouse back here. It was in the middle of the garden. It looked really ugly. I literally made it out of garbage. And uh, I had a, a kale over winter in it. And I dismantled the greenhouse in the spring, and that kale went to seed. And the seeds, I saved thousands of them. And the seeds went everywhere in my garden. And that particular variety, I've, I'm still planting that every year. Uh, it's great tasting, grows right up into December, and uh, just seems to almost outdo everything I've ever bought. Uh, and it's kind of a red Russian kale, so that's the result. This came up on its own this year. So this is a seed that's been lying in the ground, you know, tossing around, I don't know, where it come from, but there's a seed that's been dormant in the ground for a couple years, and it germinated and it grew. Now it's getting hit a bit by um, uh, slugs and stuff like that, right? But it is sort of holding its own, and this is just, this isn't even like 
cultivated soil. This is just my walking path where I put down wood chips. It's not as it's not as, this, this soil here is not as rich as in my garden beds, but this thing's still coming in, right? But it's getting attacked a bit. Anyway, just an interesting thing to notice how tough um, a red Russian kale seed is. It inclines me to do the same sort of thing. Now remember, uh, these are all parsnips I sowed in the fall. I sowed them in November. And they came up fine in the spring and they're really doing well. And it's just a great time to do it in November because it just makes the following spring a lot easier. It's one more thing you don't have to do. And it's possible the seeds actually may like that. And I have noticed that the kale that come up on their own tend to be very vigorous and they tend to be, this isn't the best example of it, but in garden beds where they've come up on their own they really grow fast and they tend to be kind of tough. They seem to be kind of pest resistant. And I have no idea why. Um, so I'm inclined to do an experiment this year where I plant some kale uh, in November and just leave it exposed to the elements and everything all winter long. So that's a video I'll do in a number of months, right? It's, it's only August. There's the kale plants I was just showing you. I just noticed another one. I didn't even know this one was here growing in front of this uh, uh, lemon thyme uh, herb. This one is almost immaculate. hasn't been attacked by anything from the looks of it. Another one came on its own. That's my kind of weed. The garden that I planted in the video called How to Fix a Problem Garden. Um, these are all potatoes that I planted in the middle of April. And they've all grown and they're actually, this one's turned quite yellow. Um, so they're, they're done. Um, they're ready to start being harvested. So I'm in, I'm in handheld melt mode here, but um, let's just pull this one since it's sort of done anyway. Let's just see what we got. Oh, got some potatoes there. Yeah, good number, maybe 10. They're not huge, but certainly respectable, right? Right, so worked just fine. There was a, a garden where we had way too much moisture, and I don't. That soil is is sort of just right, so it seems like we've solved the moisture problem. And it seems to be just fine. So uh, I think what I'll do with this garden bed is, I mean, notwithstanding the ones I just pulled, but I'll harvest it from left to right. And uh, I'll start planting uh, fall crops like romaine lettuce and uh, other kinds of greens that grow quickly. Because um, there's still, you know, no, another uh, at least two months of decent growing conditions. Maybe more if you're lucky. If you can get something like that, a tough fall crop established, uh, it might continue like maybe spinach. Right, so I'll plant some things along here. Wherever my first potato crop went in, I did this exact same thing last year. I plant, as the potatoes come out, I plant uh, fall crops behind. Because you just get more out of that soil, right? If it seems like it's a bit foggy here, I don't know if it comes across on camera, but you look at the forest, it looks like there's a forest fire. <laughs> right, there isn't, it's just fog. Every morning here we have all this fog that rolls in from the ocean. It's very, very mystical and so on and so forth, but it does, uh, it's about 99% humidity right now, so it's kind of sticky. <laughs> I did a video a while ago where I moved some uh, tomatoes on a really hot day, so I, I pulled them out of this um, cold frame, right? Just, I literally just stuck my hand underneath them and yanked them out of the ground, right? Kind of, you know, I did it carefully, but uh, I just showed you how, how I move cold frame germinated tomatoes. Anyway, so I pulled some out of the ground. These are just cheap dollar store tomatoes and uh, put them over here. And on that particular day, it was a hot and sunny day. And uh, I was just showing you a trick for uh, if you had to do something like that on a day like that. I made a little... Actually, you can see all the uh, spruce boughs in the ground. I made a little sort of spruce bough tent around them to keep the sun off of them. And you can see right now they're, they're healthy and they're looking great. Maybe some flowers are coming up. They've done just fine, both of them. Oh, look at that snake. 
Scared. I just <laughs> scared the life out of me. There's this. Let me zoom in on that. Right there. I heard him. It's like, that's the ideal example of a quiet garden when you can hear a snake move. Let's see if I can get him going again here. I can actually hear a hummingbird off in the distance too. There he goes. That is a big old, that's a good size. He's over two feet long. Hopefully eating all my slugs and snails. These garlic are getting close to being ready to be pulled. It can wait a little bit longer. Rule of thumb I've, I've read is if you got, you know, four or five or six tips like this, this color, you can pull them. I tend to leave them a little bit longer. I mean, there's still some green here, so I think there's still some stuff going on. So I don't know what's to be. I don't have time to deal with this right now. It's the, you know, I'd rather wait till the middle or late August to pull them. But I certainly, every time I need garlic for cooking, I come and take one. Not from this bed, though. I'll show you where I'm getting the garlic from. This is a bed where I planted some gro different kinds of grocery store garlic. I planted some uh, uh, Chinese garlic, that cheap stuff where you can get three for a buck. I planted uh, some uh, sort of big fat, uh, high-end uh, Italian garlic. And, uh, and other, also just some local garlic that was grown here uh, somewhere in Nova Scotia on some farm. Um, none of it seemed to has come in as strong or as healthy as my music garlic. Uh, most of the garlic I've got growing here are music garlic. Uh, I, bought, I bought, bought my initial seed stock, but I also save about 20-25%. I put aside 20-25% to 25 of my crop every year, the biggest, fattest ones, to replant. So none of these came in as well. And also these, uh, these ones in particular... They've been beset by pests. Uh, so let me just bring in close here. This one here. See all that black stuff that's on the on the stem? That's slug poop or snail poop. And there's a snail right there, right? And look, see the snails? I don't know if you can see that, but there's snails all over it. And it's like this variety just isn't pest resistant. I'm inclined to think it's it's grown somewhere where they must just spray it with stuff or something. Otherwise, they'd probably be having the same problems I'm having, right? No, I mean the garlic are okay. I'll, I'll pull one here. That's not a bad garlic. I mean, that's a good, oh, slightly over two inches, right? And I guarantee you my garlic uh, are bigger and better, right? Well, it's okay, but I'm not going to bother saving the seed stock because these are getting attacked and my other ones aren't they're fine All right let me let me show you so here's my my own saved seed music garlic there I would say the plants are about a foot or two higher and um, there's hardly any I mean there's the odd slug or snail kicking around but not to the same extent. Those ones over there, they were all being attacked. Whereas these, it's it's just, you know, here or there sort of thing. So these were planted last fall under seaweed. I have to say that uh, for overwintering um, garlic, uh, gar you know, you plant garlic bulbs in the fall and for using that approach, uh, mulching the garden with seaweed is not as good as mulching the garden with hay my experience. The garden that was mulched with hay did better. And I honestly think it's because the hay does a much better job at, at retaining heat, um, keeping the soil uh, from freezing too much. This bed took much longer to thaw out than the uh, the other bed where that snake was I just showed. Um, that one was thawed out much sooner than this. So the garlic started growing sooner. And I imagine the garlic was just happier over the course of the winter than here. So, uh, seaweed adds a lot to your soil, but if I was going to, this fall when I do all my mulching, um, what I'll do is I'll put some seaweed down because I think it does have a lot to benefit the soil, but then I'll go a lot heavier with the hay because I just think it does a better job at, uh, at, at keeping the soil from freezing. It, it delays the freezing of the soil for longer 
and because of that it doesn't freeze as hard it still freezes a bit but I did a, I did a number of videos in the winter showing which ones were thawed and which ones are which ones weren't and it was fairly consistent this year because I, I you know I set up the experiment fairly well that the uh, heavily mulched hay beds thawed out way earlier than um, the un they thawed out sooner than the gardens with no mulch I had one garden with no mulch just for you know comparison and the gardens that were mulched with just seaweed these one, these took forever to thaw <laughs> right. Since this is a follow-up video, I should mention th these are three beds. This one here, this one, and this one. These were just simple Ruth Stout beds. I did a video, a really quick, like five-minute video with a silly song where I, I made these three beds last summer. That whole area took about, you know, 25 minutes to to deal with and plant. And then I, in the fall, I converted this one into a hogo culture bed. I have a video of me doing that. And these two, all I did was put a wooden frame in and put some horse manure down and a whole bunch of hay over it. But you can see, it's worked out great. These tomatoes are just exploding with growth. And these are doing great. And these onions are doing great. So, uh, it's certainly worth your while to do all your bed preparation in the fall, <laughs> in my opinion. It's nice and cool, it's just better time to work. And that way everything's ready to rock in the spring and you can focus on planting. Let's have a look at one of these bad boys. That's the state of the onions thus far, right? So it's still growing, hasn't flopped over yet. So, uh, you know, it's a good size, respectable onion. I definitely, I am not going to need to buy onions, probably, t whoop. <laughs> That's a hummingbird right next to my head. See if I can get him. Oh, he took off. <laughs> um, anyway, that's, that's a good, I don't know, two and a half inches in diameter thus far. So um, I'm not gonna have to buy onions till <laughs> probably after Christmas at this stage because I got a lot, I got basically two good sized beds that are like this. The trellises that I built. This pea trellis is doing great. About midway through the season, you know, as, the, as they grew, I noticed them, I was worried they were gonna pull away. So I just put a one string around all the peas like that to sort of hold them in, hold them tight. It gets quite windy here, so I was worried about a good gust of wind sort of just taking the, ripping them all off. They grab on pretty good, but you never know. They, they were leaning out a bit, so that seemed to deal with that. But yeah, now they're just, you know, gone nuts. And I'm, every two days I pick a big bowl of peas and we're just eating a lot of peas. Uh, that bean trellis, uh, the beans have, the climbing beans have climbed. <laughs> And they've actually gone, uh, I mean, you, you, you got to build trellises to the height you can reach. So uh, I can't really reach much higher than this is from, without stepping, you know, without stepping on the garden bed. I really don't have a choice. This, you know, couldn't have gone much higher than this. So a, as these grow, I'm just sort of training them along like that, right? They want to go up and I'm saying, no, don't go up, go this way. That's why I want them to go, is I'm just training them along. The horizontal. They'll, they'll still put, put out peas. It's probably not optimal, but it's it's totally fine, right? It's just stuff you do in the early morning, come up before work and train everything the way you want it. Only takes a few minutes. Look, there's a couple of peas that fell down. Well, sort of walk them through. The kale bed that I weeded and mulched has gone insane. Right? That was just a few weeks ago, and you'd think I sprayed this with miracle Grow or something, <laughs> the way it's uh, taken off. These, uh, what are they called? Black Magic Kale, which is a Lacinato type kale. My first year, I have been trying to grow Lacinato kale in this garden for years, and I've never had success. Um, this variety, which I got from my sponsor, Vessi Seeds, uh, is great. It tastes, we just ate some last night, it tastes very good, it grows very well. It does require a bit of coaxing in the early spring because uh, it seems to be a little less pest resistant than this, uh, you know, Siberian kale or wild kale or red Russian kale, whatever you want to call it. Um, but now, at this point in the summer, it's doing great. And, and just to keep it real, you know, like I have not been uh, in any way regular or consistent with 
spraying these. I sprayed everything. Uh, I went away for 10 days at the beginning of July and I sprayed all my kale with um, Safer's End All. This is Trounce, which is a very similar product. Uh, does the same sort of thing. It's got the same active ingredient, pyrethrin. So, um, you know, it's a chrysanthemum based uh, chemical that uh, not very good for insects. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you do some reading about it, it is, uh, you know, very safe. And, you know, of the options you have to choose from in that category, I, I think it's, uh, my conscience is clear, and I, I consider my food organic, and I don't consider this to be an impediment to having an organic garden. Uh, it breaks down very quickly. Uh, a good rain or a couple sunny days, and it really, you know, breaks down anyway. And, of course, you always wash your stuff anyway, because there's always some some sort of bug in with your stuff, so you don't worry about it. Anyway, um, you know, that's the sort of stuff I would use once in a while to spray these. When they were very young, I had a bit of slug bait down, um, but now I don't need anything. They're just Everything's just taking care of itself just fine. I don't need to put anything on these. They're just, everything's just coasting along, tickety-boo, doing great. I haven't even needed BTK. I mean, I did a video on BTK last year, and I had a serious uh, cabbage moth problem last year. And I have not seen any sign of them at all. I don't know if it's a bad year for cabbage moths, which means it's a good year for people growing things that cabbage moths like to eat. Uh, but, or if that BTK just wiped out a generation, I don't know. But I do not have a cabbage moth problem, and I've talked to other people at work that have gardens, and they do. So, uh... Well, we'll see. Now, thus far, I don't see them flying around the garden either. I haven't seen them at all. <laughs> it's just like they're not even a thing anymore. So I don't know what on earth is going on, but hallelujah for that, because uh, that's a real pain. Although, you know, if you do have that problem, use BTK. <laughs> I can say uh, that, you know, either it just wiped out an entire generation here, or, uh, or some other environmental... Uh, event has, has taken care of that. These cucumbers are going nuts and I, I harvested my first bowl yesterday and started making uh, my lacto-fermented pickles. Uh, next time I get a batch and I get a nice quiet house I will uh, show you how I do that. Well, I thought this would be an interesting thing to talk about. Um, here's a space and I got a nice beet garden here um, but I, I can't remember why but I, there was nothing growing here. Uh, something went wrong, or I really can't remember what I had. Maybe this was just a pile of weeds. I can't remember now. I think this was like a weed. I think I left a space of my garden bare just to show how many weeds would show up in a space like that. I can't remember if it was here or this spot over here where all this board has gone nuts. Um, anyway, so I planted beets here very late. And, uh, you know, I got to say when they were young, they looked really... Uh, weak and ill and I, I find a lot of times when I plant beets they look kind of pathetic when they're really small right like this one here this is sort of weak looking color but look as they get larger they start to just leaf out and look more green it seems like the bigger they get the more healthy they seem to look so I can't speak to all cases but if you're growing beets and they're small and they look like you know oh geez I don't know if this is working um, just uh, just be patient and uh, maybe over time they'll start to come in like this and just look you know better and healthier as, as time goes by. Uh, this is a weird weed that I have coming up in various places in my garden. I have no idea what it is. It's got this sort of spiky flower at the top. If anyone knows anything about it please let me know. It's got this shape to the leaf. Is it edible? What is it? It's not lamb's quarters because I got that elsewhere. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And here's another one of those. Uh, crazy kale. So this kale actually came up on its own over here and I moved it. Um, but it's getting attacked a little bit, but th again it's a seed that I did not sow. Uh, and I haven't had just kale seeds floating around. It's, it's a seed that's been do dormant in the soil here for about three years. <laughs> that was really interesting that it came up. Uh, just to give you an indication of how unbelievably hot it is this year, this eggplant is the biggest, baddest, most phenomenal eggplant I have ever grown here. Um, it doesn't do well here. And uh, I bought six transplants and planted them here and they all died except two because it was 
just not warm enough and that would have been late June still wasn't warm enough these are the two survived that process and I was gonna throw them in the woods because I thought what's the point they're not gonna live and they did and it looks like I'm gonna get some nice eggplant I wish I had rushed to the store and bought more <laughs> you just never know what to do you know and you know my intuition was to just turf them and use the space to grow something else because it never gets this hot and stays this hot here it's it's been like 30 for days I even installed a ceiling fan in, in the master bedroom because my wife and I were just dying up there. Uh, we've never had that problem since we moved here. So it's a very special summer and uh, maybe a sign of things to come, I don't know. But um, boy, I, I love eggplant. My whole family does. And I wish I'd planted more. But just an indication if you're in the Maritimes and especially if you're close to the coast um, of just how abnormally hot it is this year. My peppers too. I, let's walk over and show you those. Look at these things. I have never had peppers this size here. Uh, when I lived in the valley, for those that don't live in, in the province where I live or live in Canada, <laughs> even people that live in Canada don't know what I mean when I say the valley, but there's a part of Nova Scotia called the valley, which is just, uh, it's zone 6A and in some places actually zone 6B as far as I understand it, but it, I mean it's zone 6A where I am here too, but I don't get anywhere near the heat they get in the valley, right? They get a slightly colder winter than here. Um, but man, they get some serious heat. It's just uh, uh, that is the agricultural belt of Nova Scotia. That's where all the growing goes on. And I could get fantastic uh, things like heat loving things like basil um, when I lived there and, and peppers and stuff like that. Uh, but I've had a really hard time growing peppers here. I got a neighbor that grows them in a hothouse. He literally has them in a greenhouse all summer long. <laughs> he's out there watering them every day. And he, he does get really good peppers, but he's got to water them by hand every day. Uh, whereas these, I haven't done a thing, but it's been hot, right? So I've got the right amount of heat to grow them. So it's actually worth my while this year. Anyway, just sort of an off-the-wall, uh, heavily unscripted uh, walk around. Just following up on a few things I'd mentioned in previous videos just to give you a sense of where those things are now. So I hope you found that interesting and gave you a few ideas for this year or maybe next year. As gardeners, we're always thinking about next year, this year, right? That's, that's part of it, the anticipation and the plan B and plan C and rethinking stuff and, and uh, wondering how it's going to turn out next time with the, the new crazy idea. So anyway, I hope, I hope that was uh, useful for you. And if it was, please like, share, subscribe. Check out my podcast, MaritimeGardening.com. Until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. <laughs>